still napping. Uh, this week we got an opportunity to study the book, The Seven Churches of Revelation. And if you haven't got a Revelation outline yet, I still have some upstairs. I can uh, bring them down. I've given them out the last two weeks. But um, one of the things we looked at in The Seven Churches is, um, I'm just going to give you a quick, kind of a quick snapshot of what we looked at this week. First, we started with the church of Eph- in Ephesus, and that was the loveless church, that they were doing all these great things for, for God, but they had abandoned, they had lost their first love for Jesus Christ. The second church we did was Smyrna, and that is the persecuted church, the church that the United States doesn't know much about yet, but we're going to learn more and more about the persecuted church because we're going to become more and more as the end times come, the church will be under more persecution. The third church we looked at was the church in Pergamum, which is the compromising church, a church that was compromising. And and I'm telling you these because I want you to take a look at your life because we are the church. So who, what church are you representing? That's I should have said that first. But the fourth church, the church in Sardis, and that is the church that none of us wants to be. And that is the dead church. Uh, we're just dead. You know, we, we have nothing, you know, there's nothing... Nothing there, and that, that's, uh, that's a sad church, um, the Church of Sardis. And then, the, well, I, I skipped one, the Church of Thyatira, sorry, was the corrupt church. You know, uh, there's a lot of churches today that are corrupt, you know. Um, then we have the church in Philadelphia, and that was what we did yesterday. That is the faithful church. That's who we want to become. We want to be the church in Philadelphia, which, what does Philadelphia mean? Brotherly love, right? So we want to be the church in Philadelphia. Then today, uh, what Carol just read was the church in Laodicea, and that is a church we don't want to be, and that is the lukewarm church. And it's, it's interesting how Jesus said with that church, made him so sick, it was so repulsive that he would vomit them out of his mouth. I mean, we don't want to represent that church, but all of us being the church are representing one of them churches. And I guarantee that all seven of them churches are in Northland Community Church. Each one of us represent one of them churches. And I hope for sure that if we're not representing Philadelphia, that, that we will. That's one of the outlines of today's sermon, that we would become the church of Philadelphia. That we would, uh, no matter where we're at, whether we're, you know, compromising, whether we're... Um, lukewarm, you know, whether we're uh, whatever, corrupt or loveless or whatever it is, but that we would come to be that faithful church. This week's focus, as you see, is lead like Jesus. We've been doing this, this is the fourth month that we have, we started back in September, and we're looking at um, lead like Jesus, and this is part four of seven. It goes, we're going to run this through March, so going to be a little different format starting the first of the year, but we're still going to uh, continue this uh, for the next, for three more months after today. Um, This week's focus, if you, for those of you who read, was the head being, being the head, the head, you know, we, we talked, you know, we, we looked at the heart, you know, today, this week we're looking at the head and, and it focuses almost exclusively on vision. And that's why today, which I usually don't do this sermon until the end of the year or the beginning of the year to give the vision for 2020, but I figured the timing was perfect um, because to the, tonight when we come back, we're going to be focusing on vision. Uh, vision is probably one of my favorite parts of leadership. There is nothing like getting a vision from God, you know, and, and when you... Uh, meditate, and as a leader, God will give you visions. You know, He will give you visions for your in your home, and, and you know wherever you lead, because we're all leading. He'll give you, but but it's important that we uh, have a vision. Because why? What does this say in Proverbs twenty nine eighteen? Does anybody remember that? Right, where there is no vision. The people perish. In other words, you die. You know, without a vision, you'll die. You have to have a vision. And that's one of the things that I love. Uh, one of my f- favorite parts of being a pastor is when God gives me visions. And, uh, 
And, I, and, and actually, he's given me this vision that I'm going to share with you today several months ago. He gave it to me very early this year. I mean, it, I've been holding on to this for a couple months, wanting to release it. And finally, today, I can let it all out. Uh, but before we get to that, I want, us to, I want to ask you a question. Why does North Glen Community Church exist? Okay, what else? Why do we exist? Why does the church exist? I, I specifically said North Glen Community Church. What was that? To worship the Lord. Fulfill the Great Commission. Anybody else? Have peace. Anybody else? Where does that peace come from? Worship. Worship the Lord, yes. I see it in the hand somewhere. So anybody else? Why does North Glen Community Church exist? Yes. Prepare us for eternity, which we're going <laughs> This is all temporary, isn't it? And we got a... I love the illustration Francis Chan gives with that long rope where he puts the, the red, red mark representing uh, our life. Could be 50, 60, 30, 40, whatever years. And then the rest is eternity. And we take, spend so much time focusing on this life that we lose focus on eternity, which is so, so huge. Um, shine a light in the darkness. Yes. What's that? The light on the hill. Okay, so now that you answered the question, why do we, ex why we exist as a church? How will you put that into action at North Glen Community Church? How will you, just the things you've heard, how will you put that in action? It's not just for the pastor to do the things you said. It's for everyone in the church. All right, we'll pray for you right now. What's her name? All right. All right, Heavenly Father, we uh, come together as one to lift up our uh, brother in Christ, Jesse, Lord. And Lord, I pray as he uh, goes to the hospital, Lord, that you be with Jeanette, Lord. Just uh, give the doctors wisdom to help, uh, help her. And, and Lord, just uh, bring peace to Jesse, knowing that you are in complete control, Lord. So Lord, we pray that you intervene in this situation, Lord. In this medical emergency, Lord, I just pray for Jeanette, Lord, that, that your peace would fall upon her, Lord, that, that you would just touch her body, Lord, and, and bring the healing that she needs, Lord. And we're going to give you all praise ahead of time as, as Jesse goes, Lord. Give him a safe trip there, and Lord, just, uh, Lord, just pray that you're glorified through this. And, and we pray all this in the mighty, almighty, powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, brother. No problem. Okay, now now that we looked at why the church exists, and one of it was just a perp just a reason right now, just a good example, just walked in the door, that uh, we're to carry one another's burdens, aren't we? And and we pray for one another, love for one another, encourage one another, and. Uh, we got a lot of one another's. I brought my one another's out. I got 56 one another's in the Bible. So I'm armed with the one another's. That was a little later in the sermon, but it came up today, this now. But back to the question, how will you put into action the reason that Northland Community Church exists? In other words, 
we know why we just we just heard why now how is the action part right how, how is as how the, we put apply action to the why because if we don't know why right we won't know how so we we know the why so how are we going to do it anybody with that show the love of Christ this is this is for us for you personally we got to take this personal because we have to put into action the reason why we exist. And then the last thing is the results. The results are what will be the results of the actions we take at North Glen Community Church. What is going to happen when we do what God calls us to do? And one of the things I, as I studied the church at Philadelphia yesterday, um, the faithful church, I kept thinking about that open door that, that, that Jesus opens the door. He's opened the door for us as a church. He's opened the door for ministry. He's opened the door for, for you and I to, to do ministry, hasn't he? And what is we supposed to do? When Jesus opens the door, we're supposed to join him in his ministry work, right? His redemptive work is finished on the cross and through the resurrection, right? But his ministry work until we take our last breath, we will be doing the ministry work of Jesus Christ. There is no retirement in the ministry. It's a lifelong, until our last breath, we will get an opportunity to um, put our actions into and, and, and just watch his kingdom, further his kingdom. Because when you get to heaven... When you stand before Jesus, when you go, when you're in there, you're going to see uh, your kingdom work. You're going to be, when you go to the great white throne, not, no, that's the unbelievers, go to the great white throne uh, judgment seat. But the judgment seat of Christ for believers is for rewards. And your rewards will be based on what we do here. You know, if you don't do anything, guess what? You ain't getting no rewards, hardly any. You, I mean, I don't know about you, but for eternity. In other words, in this life, I'll give you an example. If I told you you work this hard, you get $500 a week. But if you work this hard, you get $1,000 a week. You get work this hard, $2,000, and, and so on and so on. And, and, and I'm saying that we would choose, we would, we would want to work hard to, to, to make the money on this earth. But our rewards are much more important than the money we make here on earth, isn't it? Our rewards are eternal. And I hope you start thinking uh, with that eternal perspective, because this life is, could be ending like s seconds at any time. Okay? When North Glen loses the vision that why we exist, how we do things, and what the results will be not pleasing to the Lord, right? If we're, if we're bypassing why the church exists, if we're not doing the things that he's called us to do because this is why we exist then that's gonna, that is not going to be pleasing to God, is it? You know, and I hope that your goal in life, more so pleasing your spouse or your children or, any, or your boss or anyone, is to please the Lord. Because that's who we should be trying to please. Amen? Number two question I want to ask you. Why, it'll be up here in a second. Why aren't more people coming to Jesus at North Glen Community Church. Anybody? They see how we live. That's a good one. Anybody else? Why aren't they coming to Jesus at, at this church? Why, why aren't we back here seeing people baptized on a regular basis? Why? We're preoccupied. And guess who does that? Satan. I told you all Satan wants to, all he's got to do is give you a mirror. Because all you got, if you keep looking at yourself, Satan's got you right where he wants you. Everything's about me. Every, all I think about is me. All I think about, well, what I'm, it's about me. You know, so Satan hands you a mirror. Just keep looking at yourself. Oh, and, and that's what he, he, he gets us. He distracts us. He will do everything to, to get us our focus off of why we exist. Anybody else? Why aren't more people coming to Jesus at Northland Community Church? Yes. Stop going stupid. And I, and I would say the definition of stupid is this world. The thing, we're stuck on the things of this world. That, that, that's what we do. So, uh, yes. Amen to that. 
We're not carrying the message that, we're, that we receive from Jesus, the, the, the truth, to the people. You know, that, that's true. Anybody else? Yes. No commitment to Jesus. I love that word, commitment. You're going to hear that a lot this year. It's right here. Um, a great commitment to the great commandment, and the great commission will grow a great church. But commitment, a great commitment is our part. We, we got to be committed to the cause, to why we exist. That, that, should, that should really give us, be our main thoughts. Okay, so how will you put into action to change this, this, that why people aren't coming to, to Jesus at North Carolina Community Church? Why, how will you personally put that into action yes we do so think about that and what will the results be when we focus on why why did jesus come he came to what seek and save the lost okay so why would he leave us here wow maybe why would why wouldn't when we're saved why don't we just go right to heaven we're saved why just go right to heaven because he wants to, he's leaving us here so we too will seek and save the lost. Of course, we don't save anyone, but we are instruments that God uses to save people. And if we keep our mouth shut, if we do some of the things that you heard, if we're not walking uh, the talk, if, we're, uh, if there's many things that, that lead up to the fact that we aren't leading people to Jesus. And I'll ask you a question. How many people have you led to Jesus this year? Think about that. How many people are you leading to Jesus as we speak? How many people are you praying that will come to Jesus this year? Think about that. Because we have to be intentional, church. We can't just, we, we know the truth. We know the truth. It's in our heart. I mean, it's in our head. But it really hasn't traveled to the heart because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. When you love Jesus so much, you will not be able to hold it in. You'll look for every single opportunity to share Christ with people. You will look, it'll be like, that's like when people talk, like just give me an opportunity. I love when people come up to me and ask me questions about the Bible, questions about Jesus, questions about my faith. It's like, and, and the best question of all is how can I be saved? I've actually had people say that to me. And I'm like, I mean, you feel like melting right there on the spot. Like, wow, like, like, could you give an answer to that? If someone came to you and said, how can I be saved? I hope the Bible tells us that we're supposed to have an answer to what, what, what our faith is. That wasn't exactly how it's worded, but that's um, paraphrasing the fact that we should be able to give an, give an answer for, for who we are and what we do and what we believe, you know. Um, he gave us a mouth for a reason, you know, and we're, we, we, we're supposed to speak the truth in what? Love. We're not going to bash people over the head with Jesus. Nobody, I, I, I hate to say this, but I know someone, I'm, I'm not even going to tell, I know someone that does that. And the people come to me all the time about this person. Why? They, it, it can be a turnoff when you just start bashing people over the head with Jesus. They, that's not how Jesus wants us to be. I mean, he wants us to share the gospel but he wants us to do it in love. And there is no cookie-cutter way of sharing Jesus. Every person is uniquely different. And each and every friend that you have and I have, I don't talk the same way about Jesus to each and every person. There's the, you have to know who they are so you know what to say. But if you're not saying anything, if you aren't leading anyone to Jesus right now, Satan's probably leaving you alone because you are no threat to him. I hope and pray that you're not just living your life and, not, and just bypassing all the opportunities that Jesus gives us every day to share our faith with the lost and dying world. Because if you're just living for yourself, your rewards in heaven are going to be like really, really small. I mean, because it's going to be all about you. Uh, but there, we got, we're, we're, we're to do the work of the kingdom. This is kingdom work. This is, this is an awesome privilege that we are called what? Ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. We have that that there is no job. I don't care. Not even a pastor is as important as being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. What, what, that is a high calling. And guess what? That is the calling of every single person 
that is a follower of Jesus, that has received the Holy Spirit. We are to represent Jesus Christ wherever we go, wherever our feet tread, we are to, to share the gospel. Maybe if we stop sharing with people all our hurts and pains so much and tell them complaining so much, maybe if we stop doing that and started talking about the, the, all, the, all the blessings that Jesus gives us, that might make a difference. People might not run from you when you come to you. Because, I mean, come on. If you see somebody in a store that you know is going to give you a 20-minute thing about everything going wrong in their life, are you going to go the other way? Probably. Most of you probably will. Yes. But what will be the results of those actions that we do when, we, when we're intentionally leading people to Jesus Christ? The results are going to be that we're going to rescue people. We're in the rescuing business, aren't we? We're, we're like, you know, the EMTs res rescue people for physical, but we are rescuing souls. We, we got to look at our job like an EMT is one, one of the, I, I give them so much credit, they got to face, just like with Jesse's going, all these things that come, they, they got to face all these problems and, and, and emergencies. But we have a, a bigger emergency, and that is souls going to hell. Okay, so we are to rescue people from hell and, and, and into the kingdom of God. And I'll ask you a question. How many people have you led to Jesus this year? Because I ain't seen many people back there. I ain't, and I'm not saying they got to come to this church, but I hope you're doing it somewhere, that you're leading someone, that you're intentionally praying. The first thing we should do is pray for the people that don't have Jesus. When you start praying for somebody, you start changing your views on people. You take that, the, the the people that get on your nerves and stuff, when you start praying for them, I had a guy just in our, uh, the church at Toyota on Wednesday, somebody gave a testimony where there's a, and I know both guys, this guy is like as far away from God as you can get. He's even claimed to be an atheist. Uh, he hates, he, he, he makes fun of all of us that go, he calls us going to church on Wednesdays. But, but this guy prayed for this guy. And he can't, and, and them two do not get along. And he came to him the very day he was praying for him and was sympathetic with he was going through a, something he's going through that's a physical, uh, something you can see physically on someone. Um, that, and he came to him and said uh, that he hopes everything's okay. And he said he, he was blown away. He said, he told me, he said, Paul, he says, that had to be God. I said, because me and him don't even get along at all. And he came up to me and, and said that uh, he hopes everything goes okay and everything, but uh, it, it's amazing what the power of prayer will do to even the people that don't know Jesus. You know, uh, there's power in prayer. Amen? All right, I only have two scriptures today, and you all know them by heart, but we're going to put them on the screen uh, because what we're getting at today, the questions I just asked, are the five purposes of the church. And I've had them all scattered on the thing. They've been around there. Um, it's something that we've kind of gotten away from, but we need to get back to. Um, and there's two great scriptures that give us the five purposes of the church. And it's not just these two. Believe me, it's all over. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is Acts 2. If you read 42 through 47, you will see the five purposes of the church right there in the early church. You know, um, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God. Say it with me, church, because we know this. With all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor, not your neighbor, well, you love your neighbor too, but love your neighbor as yourself. But I like to go even deeper. What Jesus said, the new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I love you. That's the way we're supposed to love one another. And when we're not, when there's something, when we're not loving someone else, unlike Jesus, you know, you know why we don't do that? Because we listen to the devil's lie and what does, we've been studying on spiritual warfare, what does it say in uh, Ephesians 6? It says, our battle, your battle, my battle, is not against flesh and blood. But we keep making it that, don't we? Uh, I have two people in my life that really have, uh, are, are hard to deal with. They're like really tough. But guess what? My battle is not against them because they're flesh and blood. My battle, Satan is using them two people to try to, and he's effectively doing it, because these two people know how to push my buttons. They do it on a regular basis. 
And, and I'm just saying that you would not believe how, how effective they are. But it's not them. It's Satan. Because Satan knows my weaknesses. He knows your weaknesses. And he knows the people push these buttons. And you'll, you will see, you ain't going to look nothing like Jesus when, when, these two, when, these, when these people get to you. All right? So the next one is the Great Commission, as Sharon said. Um, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. I mean, it goes a little deeper. I just used two verses. Go, therefore. This is action. I love this. Uh, Jesus tells us. These are like uh, a little further on down the road. Jesus gave us these action statements, uh, action commands to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right. Uh, the, first two the, uh, the first two purposes of the church are from the great commandment. And, the, and number one is, and, and this, is what he wants, this is what God wants from us. He wants this from every single person. God wants you to center your life around him. God wants you and I to center your life around him. Do you know how you'll know whose life you center around? Whether it's not just a person, it could be a thing. I mean, I used to be into bowling really big. I used to be in softball really big, baseball, all, all kind of stuff. And I would devote, I, that would be my center. That would be the center of my life uh, around this and, and gambling and drinking. And, you know, that would be the center of my life before I came to Christ. But God wants you to center your life around him. And all you got to do is look at your calendar, look at your, look at your checkbook, look at your uh, your, your thought, what you're thinking. You know, look at, look at your life and you will see who you center, who and what you center your life around. And if there's someone else or some other thing that you're centering your life around that means more than anything else, guess what that is called in the Bible? An idol. And what does God say about idols? Right, he, he is a jealous God, isn't he? He doesn't want us to put anything or anybody ahead of him. And you know what I've noticed in my life? Whenever I start putting someone or something ahead of God, you know what God does? He takes it away from me. I've been seeing this. And, 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 I, and I see that, and he does it because he loves me. He doesn't do it because he's trying to hurt me. Yes, it hurts. But guess what? He wants the center of my attention. He, he, he wants the center of your attention. So, the first purpose of the church is what? Worship. Worship. The great commandment to love the Lord with all your heart. We can worship God in like a hundred different ways. We worship, we worship Him today through music. We worship, worship Him through His Word. We worship Him through when we give. We worship Him when we love one another. We love others, don't we? Because that's what honors God. When we honor God and put him up, we worship him. And, and, and we talked about this when, we, when I did a sermon on worry. The one thing that cannot coexist is worry and worship. So when you're worshiping, you ain't worrying. I'm not. I don't know about you. I don't worship and worry at the same time. Because my focus is all about God. Why would, I worry, why would I worry about anything when I'm focusing on God? But when I get my focus off of God and on myself, I... I, I I delete the worship part, and now it's all about me. And look at me. Look at my problems. Look how, look what I'm going through. Poor me. And we start having our pity parties. I have them all the time. I know you do too. Every one of us, I guarantee probably this week, every one of us has had at least one pity party about how, oh me, poor me. Like, look, at, look what I got to go through. I, if you ain't had one, that's, you had a great week because I've had a lot of them this week. I probably have them every day. And, but quickly, God tell, lets me know that, wait a minute. That's when I go, here's how it happens too. Here's how it happens for me, maybe not for you. I, I love the scripture, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. When I mess up is when I stop trusting God and start leaning on my own understanding. When I start trying to figure all this stuff out. And, and that is taking, because all, all we call to do is trust in him with all our heart. Just like what Jesse's going through right now. He needs to trust God, he's on the throne, and, and, and it's, it's awesome that, that when we do that. So what is going to be the center of your life? Num 
Um, and again, nothing else but God worshiping him will hold you together through the rough, difficult times. I'm telling you. You're going to come to a point where, like, you're going to realize that I just ain't strong enough to handle this. I need God. I need to worship him. I need to pour my heart out to him. Number two, the second is God wants you to learn how to love his family. We're his family, the, child, the, 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 the family of God. I know we all have our family by blood, but I'm telling you, the family by blood, only, some of that's only going to last through, is very temporary. The family of God is eternal. And there's a big difference. You might get wrapped up in your family, and you should. You, that's important. But don't forget that that could be temporal. The family of God is eternal. And, and the second part of the great commandment is what? To love others, right? And, and just like I was going to say, there's 56 one another's in the Bible. I like to just look at these every once in a while because uh, live in peace with one another. This is randomly just going to uh, do, do not speak against one another. Um, if God so love you also to love one another. Um, we know it's pray for one another, encourage one another, edify one another. You know, there's a lot of one another's in the Bible, isn't there, that we're to do. But the second purpose of the church is fellowship. Fellowship is really important. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, it's almost impossible. To, no. It is virtually impossible to have fellowship coming together on a Sunday morning and then we're done. That's not fellowship. That's not the kind of fellowship that I read about in the Bible here. And uh, I think they met every day. Uh, they met every day, and they, they were close. Fellowship. You know, we're not going to... That's why small groups are so important. That's why I encourage everyone to be in a small group. If you're not in a small group, you're, you're missing out on fellowship. There's a lot of fellowship that goes on in small groups. So... The first two tests in the great commandment here is to love God with all your heart, right? And love others. We'll just take it one step further, just as Jesus loves us. Uh, later, as we looked at the great commission, the la last words that Jesus gave us, he gave us the great commission. And what he did in them is he assigned them th three more tasks. We got three more things that we're, well, the church is called to do. And number three, God wants you to grow in spiritual maturity. Did you hear what I said? Grow in spiritual maturity. That means if you've been a Christian for 30 years, you ain't arrived. You still got some growing to do. You may think you've arrived, but you're really going backwards. You're going backwards. If you're not growing and going forward, you're going backwards. I don't want to ever stop growing in my walk with Jesus Christ. I have, I have grown a lot. But guess what? There is so much more. It's, it's, it couldn't even, I couldn't even hold the growth that I have left. In this room, it, it would bust through the, the, the walls and the, and, the, and the roof because there's so much more that God wants me to learn and to, and to grow spiritually. I, I, and I don't know about you guys, but I've been a Christian for 33 years, and I am just, I, there, I, I feel like I'm still a novice in many areas. I, I have so much room to grow. And that's encouraging because as I, I often say, even say it at work, that I like to learn something new every day. I, I love to learn new stuff. I, I don't want to just keep doing One of the, like I told you before, one of the worst things people could say to me is they come up and say, you ain't changed a bit. You're the same person you were 20 years ago. No, I hope I don't ever, please don't ever say that to me. That's like, that's like a, that means I'm not growing. I don't want to be the same person I was even yesterday. I want to grow. I want to be stronger in my walk with Jesus and my love for him every day, you know, and there's room for growth for all of us. I hope you, I hope you believe that. Okay, so we are to what? Grow to be more like Jesus. In Romans 8, 29, after it talks about all things working together for good, it talks about being conformed into the image of Christ Jesus. We, we should uh, desire that. So the third purpose of the church is discipleship. You know, we all need this. We all need to uh, be discipled, and we're called to be disciples, aren't we? Um, and disciples making disciples. We did that Bible study here years ago uh, by um, David Platt and Francis Chan about, it was, it was called disciples making disciples. That's what we're called to do. Uh, reproduce. We're supposed to reproduce, you know, to keep, to keep growing, keep coming to Christ and keep growing in our faith to Jesus. 
Okay, number four. God wants you to bear much fruit so you can be a blessing to others. He wants us to be a blessing to others. That's why we bear fruit so people... What, what, what's a fruit tree? You go what? When, when a fruit tree bears much fruit, we want to pick it off of it, don't we? And eat it, and, 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 it's, and it's good. And we want to be that... We want to be able to do this for others. We want to bear much fruit so we can be a blessing. We can... God, the blessings God gives us isn't for us to hold on to. It's for us to give away. We're not, we don't get blessed so we can just say, yeah, we're blessed, but what are you doing with that blessing? Well, how are you giving it back to others? Because that's what we're called to do. We are not here to live for ourselves. And, and that's a hard thing to do. Most of us, no, all of us deal with um, self-centeredness. Every one of us struggles in that area. Uh, I do, and I know you do too. We all do it. We all think of ourselves so much, way too much. We are called to be like Jesus. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't just think of himself when he came here? He did not come here to be served, did he? We all like to go to restaurants to be served, and there's nothing wrong with that once in a while. But we have ultimately called to what? To serve, just like Jesus did. Okay? So ask the question, what can I give back to God for all the blessings he has poured out to me. And, and that's called uh, with bearing fruit for others. Okay, so uh, how do we serve God? By serving others. That's how we serve God. He calls us to, when we're serving, just like it says, when we do for the least of these, we do it for him, don't we? We do it for him. We're serving the King of Kings. When we do things, we do it because of our love for Jesus Christ. And let people know when you're doing something. Give God the credit. Give God the glory. Let, I, I, I think a great thing to tell people, I can tell you this, I wouldn't have did this. If it wasn't for, for, for God, I, I don't have this much love in me. But, but God loves you so much that he would call me to do this, that, and the other. You know, just like Jesse coming here, that's a great example. He came here because he needed some love. He was hurting. He, he's, he, he needed love. He needed prayer. Uh, when we, and that's a, a great picture. Uh, there's a great illustration of right there how the church is to be. So what do we do? We didn't say, Jesse, go ahead out there. We, need, we got a sermon to preach. We stopped what we were doing, and we prayed for him. And that's what we do. Sometimes God's going to interrupt our plans. And we don't just keep doing our plan because, well, that's what I want to do. That's what I'm called to do. No, sometimes God's going to interrupt... Matter of fact, God's going to interrupt you a lot. He interrupts me all the time. And he's going to interrupt you all the time. Because we, he's got, a, we, we get a plan and a purpose. And, and I know you've heard the saying, you want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. Tell him your future. Like, we're, we're called to do that. Like, I've, I'm trying hard. I'm doing the Dave Ramsey as we did in January. I'm doing the, um, the, the, the financial peace. I'm trying to get financial peace. By getting out of debt. And so that's a plan I have. But guess what? God, I've been doing this plan for over four years. And it hasn't all came together like I wanted it to. But it's coming together. But he can make another detour. I mean, he, there's no guarantee. But we we, we got to have vision. we got to have purpose. But God can interrupt that, can he? He can stop us dead in our tracks. And we might have to start all over again. And guess what we got to do then? Well, we got we to trust in God, don't we? Because we, we can't do this. We can't do this on our own. We need God. So, the fifth, number five. God wants you to tell others about his love. He wants, he, he wants you and I, how can we hold this back? Everything that God has done for us. He has saved us from the pit of hell. We, are, we have the antidote for, for eternal life. We have... We know exactly what people need, but, but we need to tell others about his love. The fifth purpose of the church, as you probably can figure this one out, is what? Evangelism. And sometimes that word is, sometimes a better word is witnessing. Witnessing. We're called to be a witness. Witness doesn't sound, evangelism, sometimes people freak out. Ah, evangelism, I can't do that. I'm not equipped. I, I don't know what to say. And that's what Satan, that's a lie Satan wants you to have. Um, but being a witness of the good news 
of Jesus Christ. Man, when we go to witness, we, we, are, we got good news. We're not giving them the bad news they're going to see on TV. We're giving them good news. Good news that Jesus Christ saves to the uttermost. And he, will save, he could save anyone. No one has ever... I, I remember hearing this in prison when I used to visit the prison. I heard this more than once. I've went too far. No, not for Jesus. You've never went too far. I don't care if you murder someone. The Bible, t- the Bible will show you people. If I, okay, I murdered someone. Okay, let me show you what God can do to a murderer. Look at Saul, who's Paul, uh, a murderer. Moses was a murderer. I mean, can God use a murderer? Absolutely. I often, people per- perplex when, when I tell them that mass murders and stuff, how they could still go to heaven. Oh, no, wait, no, they did, wait, way too much. There's no way they can go to heaven. Oh, yeah, they can. Yeah, they can. Because they have until their last breath. Uh, are there consequences to what they did? Absolutely. But there's still forgiveness. That's, that's grace. Grace is bigger than murder. Grace is bigger than any sin that you can commit. God's grace is, is, is amazing. His grace is amazing, isn't it? I want you to think about who you, don't, who you, who you know who doesn't know Jesus Christ. I guarantee you know at least one, probably a 100. And the best way, as I said earlier, to start witnessing them is to what? Pray for them. Okay? All right. So now I want to get into, um, I know it's getting late. Sorry, but uh, this, is, this is important. Uh, North Bank Community Church, uh, we are a purpose-driven church. And those of you know that uh, we started this a long time ago. And, and those, some of you don't like Rick Warren and whatever. I, that, that's not important to me, whether who you like, but the but the thing is that uh, this church is a purpose-driven church, and the five and and the five purposes of church. And we're going to have a new sermon series on twelve twenty-nine. Uh, on twelve twenty-nine, we will start a sermon series on the five purposes of church. So each week we will uh, we will go through one of the five purposes, starting with worship, evangelism, discipleship, ministry, and then fellowship. And um, and the saying here is not mine. I wish I could take credit for it, but I think it, when I, ever since I heard it, I, I, I had to adopt it to this church. I think it's a great, um, this uh, is also from uh, Saddleback Church, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. How many want to grow a great church? It, it all starts with your commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. That, that's how we grow a great church at North Glen Community Church. And I want, um, who, want, who likes to volunteer? I volunteered you. I hand these out, and um, who else likes to volunteer? All right, you all hand out. Let me take one for myself. All right, I want you to see this because I've been praying about this church. How can we grow a great church? And... We have an awesome opportunity on Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights, our midweek service. Traditionally, all right, traditionally we have um, done prayer the first week and Bible study the rest of the weeks. We focus, uh, which is what? That is two purposes of the church. That is worship and discipleship. So what about the other three? Evangelism, ministry, and fellowship. Um, we're not, we are not a balanced church as of now until 2020. Everything changes in 2020. Uh, week number one will not change. We have devoted week one to prayer, and we will continue to devote week one to prayer. Um, that's why on the 29th, I'm preaching a sermon on worship, and I already know where I'm going to go. It's going to be focused on prayer, mainly. Um, and it's an awesome pr- story in the Bible about pr- the power of prayer. Um, and we see here, the focus is going to be on the presence of God. How many, lo- how many love being, is there anything better than being in the presence of God? Isn't that awesome? Being in the presence of God. Not even, not even ice cream. And the ultimate is when you're in the presence of God eating ice cream. There you go. <laughs> no. 
But the throne of grace, that's, I, I'm never going to get over the Hebrew scripture about when we enter into the throne of grace, that we receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. You know, we come into that um, time to pray and communicate and talk and listen to God is amazing. So we're gonna, that's going to stay the same. Nothing's going to change there. But week two, it changes big time. We're going to focus every week two on evangelism, and which is focusing on community outreach. And when I say community outreach, it's not just this community. It's the community at your work. It's the community in your home. It's the community in your neighborhood. It's community in this too, but it's, it's wherever you go. So we are going to do a, um, I, I've been praying and looking. I've even asked other pastors to give me, uh, what, help me. I want to find an evangelism training for everyone. Um, we've done evangelism training here before, and I wasn't even comfortable with it. Uh, when we did the way of the master, where, how it was kind of in-your-face kind of evangelism, I, I know that's only good for a few people. It's not even good for your pastor. I don't really like being in-your-face kind of thing. That's not the way, that's not my style. Well, we're going to do this, uh, it's called Becoming a Contagious Christian, or as like Vicky said it and I say it, uh, Becoming a Contagious Follower of Jesus Christ. You know, and this is an interactive study. This is a book that was out, but it's not the book. It is a video series that I, I bought 20 books and I know I underbought so please let me know because uh, I, I when, when our first meeting is January 8th we're going to do this Wednesday from 6 30 to 8 this evangelism training what it is it's it's totally different from maybe other things you've done it's personality based in other words it takes your personality and it gives you different ways of evangelism. It shows you many different methods. I think there's six or seven different methods. And they don't say these, are, these aren't all the methods. But it's very interactive. Uh, we'll be working together as a church to do this. And I encourage everyone. I know I only bought 20 books. Uh, but I, I have to be a good steward too. I mean, I'm basically going by, 20, by last year. But I, 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 the goal is on Wednesday night. Let me just tell this up front is to change the culture of the church. Right now, most of the church is not coming back on Wednesday night. Okay? And I'm asking you, and I talked to the leaders already about this. I asked the leaders. I want the leaders to, um, to ask their people that are leading to be here. So guess what? They got to be here. Because if they're asking people to come, and they're not coming, that don't look so good, does it? That's bad. Now, if people are working... You know, or sick. I mean, that's 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 understandable. I'm not, I know some people work on Wednesday nights. I'm not trying to guilt anybody into coming. I want you to be here because you want to be here. I don't want you to be here. You're not going to do anything I say anyway. You're going to do what the Lord says. You know, but I believe the Lord wants us to learn how to share our faith. And I asked the question earlier: How how many people have you led to Jesus this year? And if you can, if you're saying zero, one, two, five, six. You got a long way to go, and I got a long way to go. We got to learn how to share faith with a lot of people. Pretty much everybody we come in contact, we should. Now we'll know. We'll get the sermon. We we don't keep banging somebody. We share it with them. If they tell us we don't, I don't want to hear it. Then you move on. I'm not saying you keep shoving it down their throat. I'm saying that you keep, you intentionally try to share your faith. And I believe this is this evangelism training is good for every single person. I don't care what your personality is. I don't care if you're the quietest, if you're the most timid, quietest person, you're scared to death to say a word, this will help you. This will help the one that already is out there doing it. This will help you give you other methods and ideas on how to share your faith. So I want to encourage the church. This is like really, really important. That because truth be told, if we were all sharing our faith the way we're supposed to, we would see more than two baptisms in this church in 2019. I guarantee it. We would, and next year, we are going to bust. I already, step of faith, I asked the budget team to increase our water bill from 500 to 700. You know why? Because that thing is going to be used so much that we're just going to keep baptizing people week after week after week. And, the, and our water bill is going to go up. I hope it goes up to $2,000. I hope our water bill is the high. I hope it's a, we break a record in the water bill. Because that means we're, we're filling up this tank. And, and I'll tell you what, that'd be worth every penny to, to see people come to Jesus Christ. Amen? 
All right, week three. Week three is basically the same as we, we've, we've focused, this church since I've been here is focused primarily on Bible study on Wednesday nights. That's what it's been primarily. That's got to stop. You know, uh, Bible study, here's the great thing why we can do this, because we have small groups now that meet. Uh, we have them on Sunday morning. We have them on Thursday morning. We have Friday morning. We have Saturday morning. We have, uh, did I say Thursday evening? I think I said Thursday evening. Uh, we have... We have different opportunities, so that frees us up as a church since we've already got discipleship going on out there already, and, and I'm not neglecting you because God's, and we have Bible reading plans, and, I, and that's why I have somebody read every week, and by the way, I still need a volunteer for next week. Thank you, Carol, for volunteering. You volunteer for next week? You got it. All right. Rick. Thank you, Rick. Um, so, discipleship stays the same. We're going to be the, I can tell you right now what we're going to be studying the first three weeks of the year will be lead like Jesus. That'll be March, I mean January, February, March. And then I don't know where we're going in April yet, but that's, I know we're going to finish up lead like Jesus. I don't want to stop there. So that stays the same. And the focus is on equipping the church for action and application. You know, we want to put, we don't want to just sit and, and keep getting knowledge of the word and not doing anything. What, what good is that? If you have all this knowledge of the word and you're not putting application to it, who, what, what good is it? Come on. You know, we want to put application to it, right? So week four is something different. It's called ministry, serving our community, okay? Uh, it's different from evangelism because we are going to be going out a lot more this year in 2020. We will be out in the community a lot more because you're going to be equipped. Nobody will have an excuse not to come because we're getting training. We're going to be trained to go out and, and share the faith. So we're going to be out a lot more this year once the weather gets better. Um, so number four is serving our community. Example, I know Barry's came to me about uh, the school. Now, just like Church of Philadelphia, uh, God has opened up a door at that school. And I almost was going to ask this question. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. Um, I'm not, that's not what I'm here to do. But, but I, my goal is that every church member steps foot in that church in 2020. Because they are wanting us to go into the church. School. Thank you. You guys are awake. Good. They want us to go into the school. How many? Now, is that an opportunity or what? We got to seize the opportunity while we have a Christian, while we have a Christian principle and and supportive cast that 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 is um, invited us to be visible. Because if you're not visible, you're not leading. If you're just titles mean Zippo, you can I can be a pastor, but if I'm not doing the pastor, if I'm not being the pastor, if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, then what good is a title? You know, I don't want to go around and carry a title, but my goal is that next year, when I'm going to ask this question in January, how many people went to North, have been inside them wall, school walls in 2020? I want to see every hand in this, in this room up. That means seize an opportunity, whereas there are going to be a lot of opportunities. And if you can't get over there physically, just like Sharon said, you got the book bags. Be a part of that. That you're putting that food in there. You're going in there, okay? So do something. We we gotta. But we're gonna we're gonna not just the school. That's gonna be a big part of it. But there's gonna be other opportunities to serve our community. We're gonna look intentionally. Look. A, a good example in, in the summertime, we can look for elderly couples, elderly people, not be couples that need maybe their the grass cut. So on Wednesday night, we'll go cut grass. We've done that before here. We went looking in neighborhoods to cut people's grass that needs help, that uh, do yard work or something, some just to, or, or like we've done before, just go around picking trash up in the community. You know, and you don't know how many people have stopped when we do that and they say, thank you. They, they appreciate, who wants to live in a trash infested community? When they see the church picking up trash, they see that, they see that we care. Doesn't that say, that screams, I care. When you see all the trash around, that screams, I don't care. But we care about this community, and we're going to make a difference. However God leads us, we're going to be out there a lot this year. Two, we're focusing half our services on Wednesday to outreach, to evangelism and ministry. Living out the love of Jesus. That's, that's what we're called to do. And the fifth week, this is something that you all probably like, is fellowship. And I put here a celebration meal. What I want us to do is we're going to be keeping score 
We're going to have weekly results. I, got a, I gave, already gave it to Kim. Kim's got instructions of what she needs to do. We're going to have, uh, we're going to keep score of what we're doing here at the church. We're going to be intentional, and we're going to post it every week, um, how we do it, what, we, what we're doing. I'll put a copy out there on the, thing, on the, on the board. But each week we're going to, um, and we're going to celebrate. We're going to come together, fellowship, and celebrate. We're going to celebrate with communion. We're going to celebrate with food. We're going to have a, a meal together. Uh, we're going to have table talk. I mean, me and my wife were just talking about it last night, how we used to, when our kids were gr- coming up, we used to have dinner with them, and everybody would sit at the table. When I grew up, it was like that. Uh, when, when my kids grew up, it was like that. But now that our grandkids, she even said, we don't do that anymore, and we don't. You know, and maybe, I, I think from what I hear from people, a lot of people don't do that anymore and have that table talk, that time, and we're going to do that as a, as a, as a, as a body of believers, uh, to come together, to have table talk, to, and, and, and talk about the, the victories that we're having in Jesus, and, and so we can encourage one another, and we can have communion, and just like they did at the early church, they met together, broke bread together, and, and, and we're going to come together and pray. There's not a, every, every, every time we do it, there's five, five uh, fifth Wednesdays in 2020, starting in January. So uh, we're going to come together, and, 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 it, and it, I'm not, there's no set way how we're going to do it, but it's going to be a time of fellowship. Uh, we're not just going to talk about the Ravens, you know, or the Orioles, whoever the, the talk. We're going to try to keep our focus on, on our, our relationship with Christ, and maybe some ways we can pray for one another, and, and encourage one another, and help with one another. And, and, and I don't know what it's going to entail, because God's given me all kinds of visions of what it's going to look like, and it could look different every, every quarter. It's going to look different every quarter. I don't, I, I, who wants to do the same thing the same way every time? You know? And that's why we're changing. You know the definition of insanity is doing what? The same thing the same way and expecting different results. So I kept praying all year. I knew the way we were doing things was not working. You know, we're only getting a handful of people to come back on Wednesday night. And that is not, that is not going to build the church of unity. Uh, we can't just do it on Sunday nights. And I'm going to cut this off because I know I'm going long. But um, I just wanted to tell you, you all, to please pray about this. And, and I want you to uh, pray for your leaders, that they can be here. Pray for you. To, they're going to be, um, I've asked them to encourage you to be here, the, the, the ministries they lead, to, to, you know, encourage you to be here so uh, we, can, we can grow as a family together. We can, uh, we can worship together. We can share the gospel together. We can disciple one another. We can... Uh, do ministry together, and we can fellowship together. This is the five purposes of the church that God's called us to do. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you when we praise you, Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you for speaking to me about your church, Lord. Lord, the church in a, in its, in a whole is in desperate need of uh, being balanced and and Lord, I just pray that this coming year, Lord, that we, we can change the culture in this church, that we will not be the same, do th- things the same way. Lord, that we would come together to, uh, just to be in one with you, Lord. And, and Lord, just what a great opportunity we have here, Lord. I thank you, Lord, it's all you uh, who, who gave me this vision as I've cried out to you, wanting to change the way we do things, Lord. And Lord, I know you're going to continue uh, to, to give me and give others ideas on how we can grow better together and how we can glorify you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that this coming year, Lord, that we break every, smash every record we ever set for baptisms and people coming to Christ, Lord. Lord, I pray that we are intentional, Lord, that through our evangelism training, Lord, we will, we will have a desire uh, to, and an urgency in our heart to reach those who don't don't know you, Lord. And Lord, we give you all praise today for what you're about to do, Lord. And we know that, um, Lord, help us to have a great commitment to your great commandment and great commission so we can grow a great church, uh, one that you would smile down on. And we give you all praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.